Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, can you hear me okay over there? Thanks. Very moving plenary session we had. Um, so I practice critical care medicine in uh, Clearwater, Florida. Uh, it's sunny, but not as cold over there. And um, one of my interests has been quality, uh, safety, and process improvement in the ICU as medical director. And um, which brings us to the problem with acute kidney injury in the intensive care unit. Disclosures, there's an honorarium for presentation. Acute kidney injury, it's a major issue, major problem, and it occurs quite commonly in the intensive care unit. Um, it's more common and expensive than many other acute medical conditions, including uh, uh, myocardial infarction and even sepsis. It occurs in about 57% of patients on day one of their ICU stay uh, in a mixed med surge ICU. 42% of critical patients with sepsis may develop AKI, and there's an overall 25% mortality rate with moderate to severe AKI. About 23.5% of AKI patients receive, may end up receiving uh, renal replacement therapy. Studies vary on the amounts from 7 8% up to 23 24%, and the annual cost is, is huge at 5.4 to $24 billion. So acute kidney injury is an increasingly common and potentially devastating complication in hospitalized individuals. It affects nearly 7 to 18% of hospitalized patients, and studies show up to 50% of critically ill patients will develop some form of AKI. AKI is ranked among the top in terms of potential inpatient complications. When the kidney is damaged, there's a, a very phenotypical process that occurs. You stop making urine, creatinine goes up, you get a metabolic acidosis. Regardless of the type of injury, whether it's just hypotension, sepsis, other forms of shock uh, or metabolic issues, diabetes, or history of hypertension complicated by these new events. But the end result is low urine output and uh, increased uh, creatinine, which are late markers. So it can occur quite rapidly, typically within 48 hours of an insult and pro progressively worsening loss of kidney function. Only about 6% of acute uh, kidney injury cases advanced to requiring RTs. That's a, a one study showing a smaller number as a U.S. study compared to the previous European study showed a larger number. And we stage using the Cadigo uh, criteria with mild AKA, AKI, stage 2, moderate, or severe in stage 3. The criteria are good for epidemiological studies, but difficult to apply at the bedside. So it's often uh, largely a clinical diagnosis and retrospective, usually, when the creatinine hits a higher number than on admission or through the progress of patient stays in the hospital, whether it's on the floor or in the ICU. So it's defined in stage one as uh, a 1.5 or 1.9 times increase in baseline and more than a 0.3 increase in milligrams of deciliter, um, or urine output of less than half a cc per kilo for six to 12 hours, or stage two, as you can see, uh, increase in baseline 2 to 2.9 times or redu reduction in urine output for 12 hours, and then stage 3 are three times greater than baseline um, or uh, anuria for more than 12 hours. So one in three patients with AKI were readmitted to the hospital or ED or died within 30 days of hospital discharge. That's a significant problem with 30-day readmission and mortality. And tests assess the early risk of AKI in conjunction with clinical evaluation can improve patient outcomes. AKI is difficult to identify and diagnose before it's staring you in the face. And early detection, as in many other things that we've talked about here at the meeting, that have been talked about at the meeting, uh, time is important. Maybe not as critical initially, like sepsis or trauma, but certainly there is a significant time factor. If you recognize the fact that there is injury going on, a potential injury, then early uh, evaluation is helpful in, in reducing the risk. So a number of susceptibilities and exposure AKI have been identified, but there is no single risk factor or disease state that clinicians can use to qualify a clear risk profile. As I said, there are multiple different insults that can occur that can end up with the end result of increasing creatinine and low urine output. As you can see, there are acute risk factors there on the left-hand side, multiple from sepsis, pneumonia, uh, medications, hypovolemia, and as the injury progresses, through the course, uh, from injury to developing dysfunction with decreased GFR and overt renal failure and death. Patient risk factors include advanced age, female sex, African-American origin, 
uh, chronic kidney disease is a pre-existing problem, chronic heart disease, lung disease, metabolic issues, di chronic diabetes, malignancies, anemia, and dehydration can worsen the situation. So in retrospective studies, we found about 31% of patients had an avoidable AKI, potentially avoidable AKI, had unacceptable delays in diagnosis, about 43% of patients, and 54% had inadequate risk assessment at the time. And about 79% of moderate and severe AKI cases were not identified by reporting physicians, so not recognized. The economic and health burden of acute kidney injury is staggering. The numbers are very high, a two to three fold increase in length of stay, hospital costs, readmissions, development of CKD, especially if there's a recurrent episodes of AKI, and hospital mortality, six to 13 times worse than if you didn't get AKI. Sepsis and acute kidney injury are often comorbidities. As you can see there with sepsis, 1.6 million patients, about 250 to 270,000 patients annually can be afflicted, whereas in AKI, it's a much higher number, and oftentimes, as we've seen, unreported, 3.2 million patients leaving about 1.1 million patients when they begin to uh, more serious disease. So they have similar economic profiles. Uh, sepsis, very expensive. AKI, very expensive as well, with almost $10 billion plus in cost, increasing um, mortality, length of stay, and hospitalizations. And mortality doubles in patients with sepsis and acute kidney injury. So if you have sepsis by itself, Mortality rate's pretty high, um, but then if you add AKI to that, it becomes an even bigger problem. This uh, graphic from uh, Kumar's study from 2006 shows that for every hour's delay in getting an appropriate antibiotic, once shock has developed, increase the mortality rate by 7.6% per hour. In renal failure, uh, we notice that there is a significant increase in mortality as you go further into the, into the time course. For sepsis, we use biomarkers such as procalcitonin, uh, produced by numerous organs when there's a significant systemic inflammatory process developing. And we see an elevation in procalcitonin in the first three to six hours, then over the next 12 to 24 hours, we should start seeing an improvement if the patient's adequately treated and source control has been provided. And we know that viral infections don't produce, uh, ex don't express an increase in procalcitonin, as has been verified by the uh, COVID uh, pandemic a great way of distinguishing having bacterial and or a viral infection, one or other or both. So we've used procalcitonin as a biomarker for uh, looking at outcomes data in terms of antibiotic reduction, uh, length of stay reduction in, in the regular floor patients as well as ICU, savings uh, by reducing antibiotic exposure and um, reducing antibiotic uh, resistance and reduction in C. difficile. All these have been borne out by using a biomarker in the appropriate fashion to monitor, identify and monitor disease process. Going back to AKI, in a parallel, we know it's potentially worse for individuals than maybe an ST elevation myocardial infarction. Mortality rate for the MIs is about 14% uh, versus 30% uh, for acute kidney injury. Commonly, patients undergoing major surgeries, particularly cardiac surgery, there is an increased risk of AKI following surgery from hemodynamic factors, bypass, and uh, maybe dye exposure prior to surgery with cardiac catheterization, um, leading to uh, increase in mild risk, uh, mortality going up with moderate injury and severe injury quite significantly, and affecting the 90-day mortality as well as the hospital mortality quite significantly. AKI following cardiac surgery procedures um, certainly causes a significant problem with increased length of stay, cost, and readmissions, as you can see with the three different graphics there on the right-hand side, causing a three-fold increase in cost, length of stay, and readmission rate. Which brings us to the uh, urine test, the nephrocheck test, which is the um, TIM2 test and the IGF BP7, which will elucidate on that in the next couple of slides. So the nephrocheck test is a urine test requiring fresh urine sample. It's been FDA cleared test for the risk assessment of AKI in patients who have been at risk of exposure of an event that could put the patient at risk. It's intended to be used in conjunction with clinical evaluation in patients who currently have or have 
had within the previous 24 hours an insult that would give rise to a risk for kidney injury. And it assesses the patient for a risk of significant uh, possibility or probability of getting uh, acute kidney injury in moderate to severe range at stage two or three AKI in the next 12 to 24 hours. And it's intended for use uh, in patients over the age of 21. And the two molecules are the uh, tissue inhibitor um, metalloproteinase 2 and the insulin-like growth factor protein binding, uh, binding protein 7, as you can see. And they're elucidated from the proximal and the distal tubules there. And when there's a stress to, the in, stress to the kidney without overt injury developing, these proteins are released, and it's the product of the two that, that produces a risk index. Uh, and that's been shown to be very predictive of uh, impending renal injury if the issues aren't mitigated. So it's been a significant improvement in the past 60 plus years of renal testing. Previously, we just had urine output and creatinine, but this marker in the urine um, Mechanistically, it's a relevant biomarker for acute kidney injury, identified the TIMP2 and IGF-BP7 as relevant for early kidney stress. Um, in over 300 cardiac candidate patients with AKI biomarkers, including NGAL, Cystatin C, KIM1, were studied and analyzed via two multi-center observational clinical trials across 37 sites. This showed that these two um, protein markers had the highest uh, validity for predicting acute kidney injury before you see an elevation in creatinine, which is key. Because once the creatinine goes up, you know, 50% of the renal function has already been uh, affected. So this is an early marker of renal stress, predictive of renal injury. And in, particularly in patients who've been exposed to shock, uh, sepsis, major trauma, and surgery. So the AUC for these markers are significantly elevated, and then um, the product of those two produces a significant AUC of 0.77 and goes up to 0.8 when you combine the two. The AKI risk is really a product of the uh, tympanometallinase protein and the insulin-like growth factor in units per nanogram. Um, if the level is less than 0.03, there is very low risk of producing, of going into AKI versus a level of greater than uh, 0.3. The significance of, the, of a negative AKI score is the patient is unlikely to develop moderate to severe AKI within the next 12 hours, but a positive level greater than 0.3 significantly increases the risk to developing moderate to severe AKI over the next 12 hours, unless you do something to mitigate the problem. So as you can see here, the nephrocheck test uh, identifies the risk of AKI with a high sensitivity and acceptable specificity. So the urinary TIMP2 IGF BP7 levels greater than 0.3 identify patients at risk. It's a high sensitivity of 92%, um, and adding the two together increases the AUC from 0.7 to 0.8. The clinical cutoff was selected to identify the majority of patients at risk, so you can intervene on those patients. So if you have a test result that shows patients at risk, there are things that we can do to mitigate AKI from developing. As you can see, the sensitivity there is very high, 92%. Negative predictive value being very high at 96%. So you're really predicting those patients who won't develop AKI versus those who will. And patients with a positive AKI risk score have a greater than 25% chance of developing moderate severe AKI within the next 12 hours. You can see here the specificity is sacrificed for a better sensitivity on the previous slide. Positive predictive value being only 27% in this setting and 31% in the, in the smaller study. So the AKI risk scores are substantially elevated for intended use patients with AKI. Um, in healthy subjects, uh, patients without any history of uh, kidney disease, and uh, patients who develop uh, renal insult later on, the, the risk score goes up higher. And patients with stable chronic disease, like chronic renal failure, diabetes, or cardiac disease, heart failure, do not have elevated baseline levels. So what we're seeing here is uh, kidney under stress. You see an increase in injury. You see an increase in the uh, TIM2 IGF BP7 score. And ultimately, if it goes up higher, you get dysfunction and death. So the FDA has cleared the test as an aid to risk assessment for the acute kidney injury and specific to AKI. It's an easy, fast, it's got a 20-minute turnaround. 
and um, it requires a fresh sample of urine to be tested, not a sample that's been sitting in the uh, collection bag for several hours. So how do we use this? So the early risk assessment has an applicability in the ICU. And um, our first uh, real experience, uh, the major studies were in cardiac surgery patients where we know patients at significant risk. So this is a case from one of our patients, a uh, 77-year-old male, post-op aortic valve replacement for severe aortic stenosis, chronic atrial fibrillation, post-op comes out on milrinone and norepinephrine. Uh, on day one, as is common with most cardiac surgery patients, significant weight gain, three kilograms, oxygen saturations at 97% on three liters, the TIM2 IGF EP is 1.5, so it's elevated. And because of that, patient received fluids to improve renal function, uh, to improve uh, renal perfusion. Previously, what the surgeons would do quite typically would be first up day one, their weights up, let's diarrhea the patients. But a lot of that fluid's third space, and it probably wasn't helpful to diarrhea on the first day. Patients not having any tr trouble oxygenating, there's only on three of oxygen, no distress. But those patients who are given diuretics on day one, we found a significantly increased risk of uh, AKI over the next two or three days. So this creates a problem with increased length of stay, cost, and potential for worsening renal injury if they continue to diarrhease just to get fluid off because the weight's up. So on day two, we're seeing a weight gain of 6.4 kilograms. Again, the patient's oxygenating well on two liters. The TIMP2 now has started to come down to 0.84. But there's a poor response to uh, Lasix being started at a modest dose of 20 milligrams twice a day. As you can see, uh, on day three, weight gain continues to go up. Patients oxygenating well, 98% on uh, room air. Uh, TIM2 level has come down nicely. And the patient, because they didn't respond to uh, diuretics, was sudden on aquaphoresis. But as you can see from the graphic, the uh, sodium came down. Creatinine stayed in the normal range throughout that time period. Predictably, historically, what would have happened was they would have given diuretics, there was inadequate intravascular volume, and the creatinine would have gone up, you went into AKI. But the signal tells us to hold off on the diuretics, kidneys under stress, and as the TIM2 comes down, the patient still didn't respond to diuretics, so then we picked an alternative mode of getting fluid off without sacrificing renal function. That was for 24, 48 hours, and then the patient's urine output picked up and started to uh, diarrhea as well with uh, low-dose diuretics. So um, multiple patients can be at risk with getting AKI. The average uh, ICU patient, um, cardiovascular compromise, or patients with respiratory distress, or respiratory complications, ventilated patients can be at risk. In this case study, it's a uh, pre-op patient information showed a 68-year-old female, uh, pre-op body weight 60 kilograms, history of hypertension, COPD, colon cancer, baseline creatinine 0 0.4, Patient underwent uh, abdominal, per abdominal peritoneal resection from malignancy, but then had post-operative signs and symptoms of potential sepsis, just diagnosed from bowel leakage. Uh, patient was on a ventilator. Creatinine was still low at 0 0.5. So what are we concerned about? The patient going into sepsis, maybe significant renal hyperperfusion. The uh, PCT was going up. Patients at risk at steady septic is on antibiotics, getting fluid resuscitation. Um, so what can we do to help mitigate in this setting? Well, with dynamic measurements of fluid status, we're using things like passive leg rays uh, to assess fluid responsiveness, get the patients adequately resuscitated fluid-wise, uh, discontinuing nephrotoxic agents, uh, maintaining good uh, volume status with hemodynamic monitoring, oftentimes now almost always non-invasive, and monitoring frequency of serum creatinine, frequently serum creatinine on a daily basis of urine output hourly, and uh, maybe getting a, a renal consult earlier. This has been shown to be beneficial by using the Cadigo uh, kidney bundle guidelines there, using uh, what we talked about, reducing exposure to toxic medications, changing for alternative medications as and when appropriate, maintaining adequate volume resuscitation, um, blood sugars being kept under good control, um, sending uh, more urine studies, with serum creatinine, urine creatinine uh, electrolytes, um, urine microscopy, and uh, maybe an ultrasound at that point. And if the patients are still, despite adequate fluid resuscitation, not putting out adequate urine, then maybe getting a nephrology consult at that point. But certainly not further injuring the kidney, uh, if that can be avoided. You can see there in the post-op cardiac surgery patients that following those particular guidelines certainly showed a significant improvement 
in acute development of acute kidney injury in those patients. So going back to that patient, um, we saw the baseline serum creatinine was 0 0.4, going to 0 0.5, elevated procalcitonin, and on post-op day four, uh, the patient is on antibiotics, there's trianam, metronidazole, vancomycin, which probably you'd want to substitute at that point. Serum creatinine has gone up to 0 0.9 from uh, 0 0.4, so technically AKI on that point. Urine output is still very low, 30 cc's per kilogram on average, just at the 0.5 cc's per kilo. So you want to try and improve on that. Again, volume resuscitation, which is evidence-based using uh, dynamic measurements uh, like change in SVI, if the patient's fluid responsive or not to boluses or just maintenance fluid. And so fluid resuscitation, avoiding nephrotoxic agents is key and monitoring the patients without adding more stress. Over the following uh, 12, 24 hours, PCT is coming down um, and we see an improvement in uh, patients' outcomes with the interventions. The risk score from the uh, TIM2 was very elevated, 3.4, so the patient was silly, clearly at increased risk of developing worsening renal failure. So the BRAMS uh, PCT test, back to sepsis, is cleared for risk assessment at the front end also for monitoring treatment response for antibiotic stewardship and decision-making on antibiotic therapy and discontinuation. And that's been well borne out in the literature uh, for antibiotic therapy for patients uh, in the emergency room uh, going through the hospitalization. And even shown to benefit community-acquired pneumonia as well as COPD exacerbations and sepsis. So the NephroCheck, in comparison, also is an early tool for testing for patients at risk uh, before the creatinine goes up this, so you can implement a, a care plan to resuscitate the kidneys and prevent further deterioration of kidney function, which has its significant problems with morbidity, mortality, length of stay, and cost. So with the early identification of patients at risk, there is an opportunity for management uh, strategies that may attenuate AKI severity, thereby impacting morbidity, mortality, length of stay, and costs associated with developing AKI. This patient uh, from our, our service, 68-year-old uh, female, seen post-op in cardiac surgery ICU, had a left atriotomy on bypass for excision of left atrial mass, uh, history of atrial fibrillation, uh, mass had been seen on TE prior to an ablation for the AFib, so it's incidental finding. Post-op day one, significant fluid weight gain of five kilograms. Creatinine was normal range. The uh, TIM2 was elevated at 0.94. Patient was needing 10, li 10 liters of oxygen for oxygenation. Uh, on high flow oxygen, post-op day two, 8.5 kilogram weight gain, creatinine's going up, TIM2 is uh, elevated to 2.23, so we weren't gonna stress with increasing uh, diuretics, but still adequately oxygenating in 12 liters. Uh, by day three, creatinine's still in the stable range, oxygenation's gone to 60, 70, 60 liters per minute, 70% FiO2 heated high flow, um, and the uh, T2 has gone up to 2.49. As you see, uh, weight gain continues, and what we're seeing is a significant uh, change in the TIM2 level. Again, not stressing the kidneys by further diuresis, but then by day three or four, once the risk has been mitigated, as you're seeing by a reduced uh, TIM2 level, we can start diuretics. If diuretics don't work, then we go to aquaphoresis or CRRT to remove the fluid. So if the patient's relatively stable, not getting into worsening hypoxic failure, requiring we want to avoid intubation ventilation, then you're, you're monitoring the patient for respiratory distress or not, and then once you're able to safely get the fluid off, get the fluid off. Diuretics work, that's fine, once the uh, marker has come down significantly. Um, otherwise, we, we saw that if we added diuretics too early, then you start getting an elevation in creatinine, and then you're forcing AKI development, which is what you want to avoid. This is an algorithm that's put together by our pharmacy department. It's a little difficult to read, but basically uh, the key points there is if the patient's hypotensive or not making adequate urine, fluid assessment. Non-invasively, you're looking to see whether they're getting the fluid adequately on board. Helps improve urine output. We stick to the urine output. Um, and if there is no significant urine output over the next four hours, despite adequate fluid bolusing and resuscitation, then you start the other mitigation, uh, things like uh, avoiding nephrotoxic agents, um, sending your, doing hourly urine outputs and uh, 
controlling diabetes and getting a nephrology consult, and then alternative modes of getting fluid off if and when necessary. So putting this protocol into place, uh, we're seeing a reduction in AKI. In the, we've certainly seen it in the cardiac surgery patients, where it's more uh, almost on a daily basis we're preventing this from happening on the med surge side. It's a little bit more difficult because there's such a different variety of patients, but we're trying to put this uh, into place to, to mitigate uh, renal failure in these patients. It's a strategic goal across our system for the next year. So to summarize, biomarkers can help improve disease management, uh, whether it's in sepsis or in renal failure. Renal failure creeps up on you. Sepsis, maybe uh, even as we've already discussed in many meetings, uh, sepsis isn't always so easy to, to uh, identify early on. It's very difficult initially sometimes. It's not always straightforward. The renal failure creeps up on you, on patients who you kind of expect it, but you don't see it until it's there. And then when the creatinine is going up, as I've said, you've got 50% of kidney function already uh, gone. So that can be a problem. So the earlier you detect it, the better. And we're feeling that using this marker in our system certainly has helped in the identity, identification of patients at risk and mitigating the risk by uh, putting in the Cadigo uh, kidney resuscitation guidelines earlier than we would have done otherwise. This is the disclosure slide. It's the end of the uh, talk. Any uh, questions?